I think to a certain extent that may have increased some theater artist interest in creating the kind of theatricality that can only be achieved not in a streaming or a TV format, but rather on stage. You've had some recent plays that have been were very successful, plays that are extremely long and that achieve a kind of electric theatricality and intensity from pure duration, like... Madison, how well do you know theater? I did play Tiny Tim in the fifth grade, so you could say that I'm an expert. I wish you would have joined us for this call then. Kevin knew more than I did. I'm not a total plebeian, but we sat down with Celia Wren, a freelance theater journalist. She writes a lot for the Washington Post, as well as a couple other outlets. And she talked to us about regional, national, international theater trends, what happened during COVID and more. So this was a good interview with her to talk about all things theater. Stick around after as we discuss some of the shows and movies we've been watching. podcast, Celia Wren. Talk to us a little bit about your interest in theater and where that first came from. I was always interested in theater starting as a child when I was in acting in school plays and the like. My grandmother was a movie actress. Uh, my great uncle was a famous vaudevillian. So that sort of came down through the family. And then the older I got, the more stage fright I got. But I was also, and I was also very interested in writing. So in college, I started reviewing plays. I was still acting, but then I got more and more stage fright. So I dropped the acting and just, I started writing for the school paper. I was the arts editor. And then I parlayed those clippings into some freelancing work. And then for a while, I was the managing editor of American Theater Magazine, which is America's national theater magazine. And then I wanted to do more writing. So I went back to freelancing, which is what I do now. Nice. And I want to say, I know I've seen some of your articles. Do you write more for certain publications? I write almost always for the Washington Post these days, just because in the recent years, it's kept me very busy They with a lot of assignments. I have also write for American Theater, which is my alma mater, as I mentioned. And I have written for, for a lot of other places in the past, but mostly I've been, I've, I live in Washington now, so mostly I've been writing for the Washington Post. And Washington is a fabulous theater city with yeah. great, a bunch of great theaters and amazing actors. And so it's a great place to be for the, from that regard. I've like never thought of Washington as a theater city. So that's so cool to hear. You always hear about like New York and L.A. as like these big theater cities. But I've never thought of Washington as a big theater city. That's right. Uh, yeah. Of course, Chicago is really Chicago called the as well. city of theater. But but I, I come from when we were when I was at American Theater, we covered the regional theater movement, the mm-hmm. regional theater. And I don't know. So you don't know too much about theater in general or. I'm somewhat familiar with it. I did a decent amount of acting in high school, and I was somewhat involved with what's going on with the local theater, especially here in Vegas, because we had a musical that went pretty viral recently. It was called Screamed. It was like a musical parody of Scream. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it went. It was huge on TikTok to the extent mm-hmm. that, like, if you were a TikToker, you came to see the musical and you posted a clip of it, you'd get a hundred thousand views, like almost guaranteed. So it was just like this huge viral sensation Mm -hmm. and a really close friend of mine was involved in it. So I've been like somewhat involved in like the workings of it through her, but I'm not too familiar with regional stuff. So I'm I'm super curious. Theater on Broadway it gets a lot of the buzz in America and a lot of Broadway shows go touring. And right. But there's a very long-standing tradition of regional theater in the U.S. Out, professional theater, it really got a big push in the 1960s, thanks to grants from the Ford Foundation. Hmm. There were a handful of serious professional companies around the uh, country before then, but it really, the it real push came in the 60s. And just a whole bunch of hundreds and hundreds of regional theaters, professional, high quality regional theaters got got started in that era and subsequent decades. And the overwhelming majority of good plays and musicals 
in America originate in the regional theaters and then they will mm. go to Broadway. Very few things start cold on Broadway. I think, for example, about 10 years ago, the I saw a count where 32 of the past 34 Pulitzer Prize for drama winners premiered at nonprofit companies. So the regional theaters are largely nonprofit companies. The commercial theater in the U.S. is the Broadway and then the touring houses in general. So anyway, there are some great theater towns. Philadelphia is also a great theater town. And uh, Washington is just is amazing. It also has, I think, because there are a lot of lawyers in Washington and Washington mm. is a very educated populace. There are a lot of there are an unusually large number of Shakespeare oriented companies, but also like Arena Stage in Washington was the first theater to regional theater to send a show to Broadway. At least I think it's often credited like that. So that and that's uh, regional theater is what we covered when I was at American Theater. So I'm especially attuned to that. And I am just think regional theater is great. And it's really where the great plays come from first before they go to Broadway in general. There are also nonprofits in New York that are not Broadway that send Hamilton originated the public theater, which is an off-Broadway theater. So that is also part of it's not regional theater, but it's part of the nonprofit theater movement. So that, in a nutshell, is what's happening in the theater landscape of which the Washington Theater is a part. I was going to say, what makes a, a good city for theater? Or is there a vice versa effect? Because I, my partner works a lot with the L.A. Philharmonic and the Globe, Old Globe down in San Diego. And it's always been their game of how do we get more people to the theater, which I know must be the talk of theater everywhere. But what are some of the hallmarks of a good city or a good community that is interacting with their theater. Yeah, a lot of theater, great theater towns have a bunch of local actors who will uh, act regularly, but some big theaters will bring in actors from outside. That's a very good question. You, you get a, you'll have a, a big regional theater, I think, that does great shows, and then um, it will attract more interest in theater, more actors, and then you'll get smaller companies outside of that. But that's a good question. What exactly is it like? Is it income or or education level? I'm not really sure. I'd have to look at the statistics on that. I, I mean, know just like public funding could be. There's um, not a. There is some public, like local, state, and regional funding for. But in general, in America, there's not a gr lot of great funding okay. from for for a theater or the arts. They're all local streams of funding. How does American theater compare to places like the UK or maybe France or elsewhere around the world with their theater companies? Oh, outside of the US, you do have, I believe, governments, national governments funding the art. They have an easier time of it, I believe. In the US, theater is has long been known as the fabulous invalid. That was a, a a term that I think Kaufman and Hart originated. Talk about how theater always seems to be in dire straits, but it never actually dies. And especially since movies have largely taken, before there were movies, people, I think, went to the theater more. And recently, theater has, in the U.S., and I'm not familiar what has happened abroad, but since the pandemic, the theater has not fully recovered. Hmm. And the audience have just not come back, partly because Got, got so used to being comfortable and getting your entertainment at home during the pandemic. And it, it takes a real adjustment to get back out there. And theater hasn't managed to attract all the audiences back yet. So in fact, uh, what we're seeing right now is uh, a period of deep, of kind of deep crisis for a lot of theaters where a lot of regional theaters have closed or not closed or, or downsized yeah. or started doing fewer performances and Broadway attendance is also down compared to pre-pandemic. And then that has exacerbated some other factors, like when the regional theater model started, ramped up in the 60s, there was something called a subscription model, whereby companies would sell audiences on getting a year, years, basically a year supply of plays from them, which enabled theaters to take on more risky uh, shows because you could do one big crowd pleaser and then a risky show and you'd have sold the whole package for the year. And then uh, recently people to do their entertainment more at the last minute. And so the subscription model has been declining. And that's uh, another factor that's pre pre 
uh, placed a lot of pressure on theaters because it's mm. more expensive to market by the play as opposed to get everyone to shell out for a big, long, full package. So these are some of the pressures that the theater, at least in the U.S., is on. And I, I'm not too familiar with um, the ecosystem too much these days in other countries. So there's a lot of back and forth between British and American theater because we're very attuned to what's going on there. It's the same language. And I think there the unions have special deals where I believe I, I'm not an expert on equity rules, but I know there are a lot of shows from Britain that come to the U.S. and there are also a lot of British plays that get staged here and vice versa. So mm. there's a very healthy back and forth between England and the U.S. That makes sense because there was a similar like union deal that was happening in the early 60s that like led to a lot of that British invasion. So mm. I imagine they have a similar thing that happened with the theater companies and that could explain too why theater started becoming more of a... Uh, recognized thing in the 1960s with um, those types of union deals could have like helped spur that on a little bit uh that's possible being the union piece of the puzzle has been part of the regional theater movement and then in terms of of england we have a very pronounced anglophilic streak in american <laughs> culture so if something goes over big in britain it's very inclined to attract a lot of interest here but we've got a lot of great homegrown things. There's not that much theater in translation done in the U.S. Mm. These days, there are a couple of big exceptions. Yasmina Reza did a play in French called Art that was translated. But in general, we don't do a huge number of plays in this country that are, were written abroad and translated for whatever reason. Is there any play that you've followed from the very or like a favorite play that you followed from the ground level where it starts in the regional theater and you've helped promote it through your writing and seen it ascend to a really high degree of popularity? Oh, that's a good actually, yes. Some there are a couple of big a new play festivals around the country that tend to promote new shows or like the other brand new, or one of them is in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, which is about 90 minutes from here. And they some of the plays I've often gone and covered world premieres and things there. And so there are some shows that I've seen there that have gone on to be some of the most produced plays in the U.S. I think for I'm thinking, for example, of there was a play called H2O, which was about a, a movie star starring in Hamlet. I think I gave the first I gave the first review to that. I really liked that play a lot, and it went on to get quite widely produced. And I've produced there's some some. Small play, plays that started at small theaters locally. The works of Lauren Yee, who's a very widely produced playwright. I've reviewed some of her early shows or some early productions of her shows. I'm trying to think. I don't know if I, I've given the, an early push to anything that ended up on Broadway. I can't think of it. If something occurs to me, I will let you know. But certainly there are a lot of plays that get done all around the country that I've written about. If I think of any more examples while we're talking, I'll let you know. No, those were great. I, I, it's super interesting to hear just like the formats and like the and how you'll notice something at a festival and be like, oh, I've got to talk about this one. Or you'll know that a certain playwright is coming out with new stuff. So you're like, OK, we've got to be on track for her because she's going to write something great. We know it's going to be great. We need to be on the ground floor. So that coverage is happening as soon as possible. So we can be one of the first uh, publications to write about that. It's very interesting. And then I, I think you one of the questions you said you were going to be t interested in talking about is theater in the age of streaming. Yeah. Mm. And I did want to point out, I think this is an undercovered story from our culture, but that the, the golden age of TV and streaming or what I guess we're, we're calling peak TV now <laughs> is it's really playwrights who have powered this golden age of TV. You've got a huge number of playwrights who have, are, are, have been the showrunners or of or screenwriters on streaming shows like when my husband and I watch television I, I, I will when the credits roll the star I'll say right playwright every time the <laughs> playwright's name comes along I was just talking the other day to JT Rogers who's a creator and showrunner of Tokyo Vice and I oh, reviewed yeah. one of I the world premieres of his plays he's a, a great playwright and then you've got just innumerable examples of this 
And I think it's because playwrights can really, first of all, they can make much better money writing for streaming and television than they can in the theater because of the economics. But also, I think it can really allow them to flex their writerly muscles in terms of character development and dialogue and long scenes, whereas when you're writing a play, you've got to really compress a lot. And I think that that so that that's a real I think that's really such an interesting phenomenon. And I think I think to a certain extent that may have increased some theater artists interest in creating the kind of theatricality that can only be achieved not in a streaming or TV format, but rather on stage. You've had some recent plays that have been very successful plays that are extremely long and that achieve a kind of electric theatricality and intensity from pure duration. Like one of the Mm -hmm. finalists for the Pulitzer Prize in recent years was a play called Public Obscenities. It was a three and a half hour long play that's partly in Bengali that unfurls in very real time. You're watching people get ready for bed and it's all real time. And it was hugely theatrical in that way. The Flick is a play by Annie Baker that was uh, three plus hours that is about people who work in art house movies theater and I think that that may be kind of reaction to 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 theater and to tv and streaming as a major cultural force you also have a lot of in recent 20 years I'd say a lot of people doing musicals where the cast the actors also play the instruments which is also very theatrical touch and I think also the streaming and how well it's been received and how big it has become is, has reminded some playwrights that just audiences are capable of processing great narrative complexity. Because in a streaming shows, you can have multiple storylines going on at a time. You watch how many seasons was it of Game of Thrones, like seven, and you, every t- yeah. time you've got a new character come on, you try to think back over previous years. And I think that has reinforced a new round of formerly audacious plays that are meta-theatrical and non-linear. That's not a new thing, but I think you have had a lot of recent playwrights who feel perhaps more confident about the audience's ability to keep abreast of that kind of thing. For example, in recent years has been a a number of uh, Black playwrights, especially who've created just some super formally exciting non-naturalistic work which which play with um, time and storyline. Like the 2020 Pulitzer Prize winner was a musical called Michael R. Jackson's musical, A Strange Loop, which is a meta-theatrical musical about a Black gay theater artist writing a musical about a Black gay theater artist. And of course, Jeremy O. Harris's slave play was a big phenomenon. So there are, there's, and I don't know, I'm, I think that might be, people remember now that audiences are really capable of keeping a lot of, keeping a lot on a track of a lot of stuff in their heads. When you were talking about that, it made me think with this kind of like cross-pollination between TV and theater kind of happening where these Playwrights are writing for TV and then taking back some of that information about the audience's capabilities of following these long form narrative concepts. Has Do you know of anyone who's doing a ring cycle type thing, how Wagner has this episodic no. form of a uh, thing? Is that starting to happen? Are you seeing anything like that? That actually predates streaming because right. <laughs> August Wilson, are you familiar with August Wilson, the playwright? Mm-hmm. Okay, August Wilson is one of the last century's most important playwrights. He's a black playwright and he wrote a play called, he wrote 10 plays called The Century Cycle. They're all set in Pittsburgh, except for one is not set in Pittsburgh, but they have recurrent characters. And there's one written that's set in each decade of the 20th century. And recently I've seen there are a couple playwrights that have taken their cues from or been inspired by that to, um, to also write something that they're considering a cycle I think there's a Nigerian-American playwright who's writing a cycle of, I think, so far nine plays about the Nigerian-American experience. And I did see another reference to that. And Dominique Morisseau, who's a playwright from Detroit, has written a bunch of plays from Detroit that are set in Detroiter. And I think maybe there's some cycle element that she conceives that to be a part of but but i think so anyway there you are you asked about cycles and (laughs) And, and there's the cycles okay great thank you so much that was actually really informative yeah just because when you went on the tv i was like oh 
if a playwright was to do that, it would be like the Wagner ring cycles, like where my mind immediately went. And then to hear that they are doing these cycle, these like episodic things, I think is very cool. I think that's uh, a really but August Wilson obvious. long predate streaming. August Wilson's right, play course. started decades ago. He's yeah. But that that is interesting. And there have been some plays that that have been some trilogies. And of course Tom Stoppard did a a set of trilogies set about in the lead up to the Russian Revolution. So there are playwrights who do cycles. Very cool. Let me Very ask cool. you this. Disney put some of Hamilton's plays on their streaming service. And I think they're going to do the same thing with maybe like the Lion King play. There's some discussion of some other things they might bring over. Does it scare you at all that this could be where we move with more commercial plays? Does it affect regional theater at all? Is there any worry about this taking the theater from the live experience and kind of bringing it to the mass audience on a TV screen? That's a very interesting question because, of course, during the pandemic, a lot of theaters and artists did switch to online where I think you'd get most theater artists saying it's just not the same. And I know that it, from I having watched in a lot of plays online during the at the height of the pandemic, it's very hard to it's harder to concentrate on a play on your computer screen than it is when you're in a theater where every, all the lights are all out and you've just got to look at the stage. Yeah. So I think Disney doing Hamilton was part of that. And I think they found I don't think. I don't know. I, I don't think putting Hamilton on streaming cuts down on the number of people who want to go see Hamilton in person. I doubt that it does. I don't know how know the data on that. But a lot of the contracts that stage actors work on have very rigorous parameters on what can be put online. So a lot of theaters don't typically put their shows online. And I think there is a sense that in the regional theater, if a regional theater put its shows online, that even if they could, even if the contracts echo, echo system allowed them to do that, that might bite into their audience. So there was a feeling during the pandemic and even afterwards that street, putting online theater, and you still have some theaters that will put a couple performances like live streaming, maybe not recorded, not on demand, but live streaming, which seems like a safer bet because then people have to commit. They got to buy a ticket. They got to sit there and we'll watch it then. Some people felt that that online theater would add to accessibility. Like there are people who have trouble getting into a theater or a transportation is an issue. I, I haven't seen a huge amount of anxiety about the online Hamilton or budget shows. You, you all already have like PBS great performances will show mm -hmm. filmed plays and some plays have been, other plays have been captured in terms of for streaming. And I think in general, a lot of theater people feel that so much of the theater experience is being in that room live. The big th belief that I believe all theater people have is that every performance of a play is different, partly because the audience is basically the co-creator of that experience, because the audience will respond differently. It'll laugh in different places. Sometimes you'll have audiences that will not respond or they'll be noisy. Or And then part of the joy, I think, for theater performers is that you can vary your performance. You can get a different give and take. You can emphasize different ways. Every performance is different. I think theater people have a certain amount of confidence. That is part of what makes theater great and that people appreciate that. And then that going, getting out, I counteracts what I said about how comfy and convenient it is to watch things from your sofa, but that there's also a belief that being in the real live event is just a very exciting thing that's different from watching something in a mediated format where you can't really affect the performance. Mind if every single big touring show was put onto streaming on demand, I, I think people might be start to be anxious about that, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. Yeah, it sounds like there's not a worry of modernizing in that way for the theater, of going to streaming, live streaming everything, people will be on their couch. Are there any other areas where you think theater will modernize? Like, I went to a lot of plays in the West End when I lived in London. There's lots of effects going on. There's lots of projections, very cool things. But we don't see maybe VR or 3D coming to theater anytime soon. Is that right? 
That's a good question. There's definitely projections has become a huge factor in stage in recent years. In terms of VR, I mean, around the pandemic, you had things like I, I wrote about a play that was a phone tree play where there was these playwrights who scripted this phone thing where the you were like calling into a, of course, that's not new technology. That's your phone. That's an old thing. But there were that have been a lot of adventurous attempts to do things like that. I'm not sure about virtual reality. I think there are probably some, I remember also some during the pandemic shows where you could vote on the ending and things like that. I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm not really aware of any major, I'm sure there are some, but they're not. Or, or, or even to hit on the buzzword, living in LA during the strikes that have just happened, everything was all about AI, AI. But I haven't really heard that same worry when it comes to theater, where AI could help you write a script in theory, probably more down the road than right now. But is there a worry at all there about how that affects playwrights or the real theater experience or who gets a Tony? Has that really been a discussion? Oh, that's that's an interesting question. I think people, creative people in general, are a little bit terrified of some AI, and I'm sure that has affected some plays. I, I, th- I think there have been attempts experiments to see what an AI play would do. And uh, I believe I saw some reference to that and it to being not very good. But I think people, I think we're all in general <laughs> terrified of uh, AI taking our taking our, our jobs. I, I agree that you haven't heard so much about it in the theater as you have in, in the Hollywood TV realm. But I think that's partly because the writer strike was because there was a contract coming up for renewal, yeah. right? I don't know that we've had a comparable contract coming up for renewal in a way that would bring that to the fore recently in theater. I'm sure it'll have to come up at some point. Theater is created in very community-oriented spaces. Playwrights will write their plays, but then the play will be developed in the last, during rehearsals, basically, up to the very last minute, a playwright will be in in the rehearsal, will be tailoring lines to see how it plays. So I think perhaps in the, in Hollywood and streaming writers' room, there was more sense that could be snuck, like AI could be snuck in, like yeah. remotely, or, or people would take it amiss if you had a computer program running right there in the in a <laughs> rehearsal. And then, yeah, I think theater comes from a more community spot at the moment where that hasn't been forced that issue to front in the same way. When you're when you're looking at a play as from a writer perspective, as someone who's going to write about it, what are you looking for in the plays you watch? What makes something great and uh, easier to write about? Is it these little gimmicks that they might do? Or is it is there some other quality? Is there a certain stage design? What are you paying attention to most for when you're writing your articles? That's a great question. What I like in, in plays is a sense that the characters are more than their situation. They're more than a, cert- a name with a backstory or a representative situation. I want uh, characters to have more than that, to have some kind of indefinable soul that makes them more than just the sum of their backstory. And of course, another thing that you're always looking for in theater, I like in general, my own personal taste, or of course, everyone who writes about theater has different tastes. My own personal taste is I like things to be surprising and zany, a little, maybe a little bit zany. I, when I use something, the word weird, it is a compliment. I like things that are surprising and, you know, that don't seem to come from um, as if the play was put together in a focus group, really idiosyncratic, things like that. Of course, another thing that you always look for when you're reviewing a production is, um, so when you're writing about the theater, you're usually writing about two different things. You're writing about the, the underlying property, the script. Of course, not all plays have scripts. Some are movement plays or are, are devised by the ensemble. But in general, you're writing about the script and you're also writing about the production and what the director and the creative, this particular creative team have brought to it. So when you're reviewing a world premiere, those two things are one and the same because the show hasn't been done yet. But like very often you'll be what you'll be reviewing another production of Hamlet. So at which point you're not called to weigh in on is Shakespeare a good playwright? That question has been settled. You're talking about what has the director done to make this a resonant 
must see Hamlet? What new angle are Mm -hmm. they taking? Um, And the same thing goes to a lesser extent with other shows that have been done previously. So you uh, want to, and some can be hard to discern the directorial approach because to a certain extent, at least in some cases, a great director will not leave their fingerprints all over the show. The show will just seem so perfect and as if it must be the way it is that you won't Mm. see all the choices that the director has made but then there are also things but you know there's some very bold things that a a director can do particularly in stage in the classics but you're also looking for things like the design the designers the sound design this especially the set design the costume design because that's a thing that a lot of people notice uh, of regular theater goers notice and then of course the quality of the acting which is another thing that can be hard to describe because great acting to a certain extent has what my father used to say calls that certain je ne sais quoi I just can't put my finger on it's something indefinable that just makes the acting great so it's some, sometimes hard to describe that yeah and there are always so many factors in a production that you can't always write about them all. At least my, I know my own word count for reviews has sometimes gone down over the years where I would really like to go into what the sound designer has brought to a show because sound design really operates at a really emotional level. And especially if music is introduced, it can change the whole emotional tenor of a te- of a scene. Lighting design can do that too. But sometimes you have to, when you're writing a review, for instance, you've got to really restrict the amount of attention you devote to those design elements just because you don't have room and your word count is running out. And then you also want to take into account, like when you're writing a review, is how does the theater relate to recent developments? You what you often want to provide a little context about, for example, there's been, I, I would say in the past 25 years, there have been a lot of very high profile musicals that have incorporated deaf artists who do signing in the context of a musical, and so when you're writing about a, a musical that like that, I wrote about a, a, a production of The Music Man that had a, a deaf lead actor and 50-50 representation in cast and crew, I believe, of deaf and non-deaf artists. You want to relate that to, uh, I had to point out that it wasn't the only first time that deaf artists had been incorporated in a, in a mainstream musical that it had happened before. So you want to try to keep abreast of things like that are happening around the country. Now, you just talked about the last 25 years. With the last question before we let you go, what do you hope to see in the next 25 years? If we can take a little time machine there, what would you say about how theater has grown, changed, or stayed the same in this newer era? So uh, a big thing that's had a lot of attention in recent years in theater in Uh, has been an increased attention to the importance of issues around representation and diversity on stage and off stage. Um, During the protests, uh, during and after the protest against systemic racism of 2020, there was an increased interest in a lot of theaters about um, staging more works by playwrights from diverse backgrounds and underrepresented communities. And um, before that, um, there's in the 20, there was attention to the fact that male playwrights Got we're getting done much, much, much more than female playwrights. And at that point, there was a bunch of female identifying playwrights came together and put together a list of unproduced or underproduced work by women and playwrights who are women, transgender, non-binary, to try to wake the, the theater up to the fact that there were there's a great pipeline of plays that should get done. I continue to, and I think it will, that there'll be increased parity and representation of artists from diverse backgrounds and artists who are her women or non-binary. So I hope that keeps going and hope that the theater, of course, since we we are having this hopefully temporary crisis in the aftermath of the pandemic, I hope that the theater will remind audiences that going to the theater is like nothing else and that how rewarding it can be to, even if it's very comfortable on your couch, to get out and go back to the theater. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of people hope the same thing for movie theaters, but it's a totally different game when you're talking about regional theater, community theater, and things that are at the smaller than commercial level. So I hope so too. I know that I've been to the theater more in the last five years than I had in my other 25. 
<laughs> and I, I definitely have an interest in it, and I hope everyone listening today has learned a little bit and takes the step to go to regional or, or otherwise local theater and get a button to seat, turn the phone off, and enjoy the acting, the stories, and, and the presentation. I, uh, ditto. Well, thanks again for coming on today, Celia, and we'll hope to catch up with you again soon. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was fun. Bye. What were you up to today? I saw some pictures. I saw you hiking. Oh, I was. I went up to the Uintas yesterday, and I did like a twelve mile hike by myself My up in the rooftop of Utah. It was so good. For all the city folks listening, including people close to me, they hear <laughs> I went alone to hike, and they think, <laughs> and somehow you made it back. What's wild is this is definitely like this bear country, right? There's moose up there. Yeah, moose are actually more dangerous than bears, but like. The only thing that I, I did have like a blackbird kind of fly right at me. It might've been territorial and I'm like, Hey bro, sorry. And I saw deer, but like actually literally the most dangerous thing was that there was like, it's monsoon season here in Utah, which means we're getting like thunderstorms every afternoon. Oh yeah. And the one thing you don't want to do in a thunderstorm in the wild is be out in an exposed area because then you're the highest point. And my dear listeners, I was out in an exposed area. <laughs> I, was the lowest, <laughs> I was the highest point. And so I was taking some videos and you can see me like, I'm just like taking the videos and there's some cloud cover. And then all of a sudden I hear the storm and my eyes just go, oh no. And then I close my phone up and I just like make for the tree line. Cause it's, it's not like you don't want to, you don't want to stand underneath a tree, but you don't want to be the only tree. And so that was my day yesterday and I did 12 miles of it and it was fun. A little excitement out and about. <clears throat> Driving through Utah, we drove to a wedding up in Colorado not too long ago. Lightning was striking at every peak right above the road, just like every little step, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. And it was close, but I was like, I guess as long as we see these mini mountains, then we're fine, <laughs> which is probably not true. But you're a bold man. You're I was on top bold. of the mountain. Yeah. And I was the only one out there. I literally was the only human being on this trail for all 12 miles, all six hours of hiking the only one out there my gosh we're glad you made it back just in time for our podcast today just in time what have you been watching when you've not been on top of mountains in the middle of monsoons dude i watched how many of the disney channel original movies did you watch growing up we didn't have the disney channel but i think by the time i hit high school and we did have it i saw a good chunk okay did you ever watch brink no. What the one about the, the skaters? <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, so Brink is, it's a movie about like inline skaters. It came out in 19, and it's like set in Venice Beach area. And it's about, it's the split between, you've got the, you've got the protagonist group of, of friends in school, and then you've got the rival group. And one is they're called soul skaters and they skate for the love of it. And they just love skating and they're Amazing. like sell out. And then the rival group is sponsored and they're called team X blade and they're sponsored. And so they get paid to skate. And this movie, I think defined a lot of what I viewed as cool as a kid, because the main character is this like surfer adjacent inline skating blonde guy with long hair and he says things like when you woke up this morning did you want to were you thinking you wanted to talk or were you thinking you wanted to skate and i'm just like that's a sick line dude eternal questions of the soul <laughs> there's a lot of dudes there's a lot of bros and a lot of just like hey can we just like live our lives together man we were here first like we, we don't have to kick each other off of the skate out of the skate rink we can just like i'll be here together and then, of course, the main character, who's there, his last name is Brink, Brinker, but they call him Brink in the movie, it gets put into this moral dilemma because with the Disney Channel original movies, there's always some level of like insane melodrama going on. And like this kid's dad is out of work. And so his mom is the one doing all the working for the family, bringing all the money. And he overhears his parents talking one night about how, oh, they're not sure they have enough money to like make ends meet. And then, He's like, oh my gosh, I need to, I need to like try out for the sponsored skating team so that I can get some money to help out around the house. And it's like, it's actually a really, it's a really good like moral dilemma to put a teenager in because his whole identity is wrapped up in being a soul skater. 
which is where like, oh, they just skate for the love of it and they don't need the money. They don't need the sponsorships. But because he's in this kind of moral quandary with his family, he feels like he needs to step up and provide and help out. He ends up trying out and making it, of course, on the the Team X Blade, which is the, the sponsor team. And he has a big falling out with his friends over it because his friends are like, dude, Brink, you sold out. And he's like, <laughs> he's a teenager and he doesn't have the communication skills enough to be able to be like, but guys, I needed the money. Yeah. And it's this classic, like not another teen skate surf movie where your rivals are actually just like, they're literally you. They're just wearing a different colored shirt and everyone's <laughs> calling each other losers and wimps for literally no reason at all. And so a lot of the drama is completely manufactured, but it is a solid Disney channel original movie. I love it. Yeah. I saw it came out in 1998. So yeah. you must've been what? Seven, eight years old now. Yeah. I was seven. Well done. And that was prime time because I was trying to figure out, I'm like, okay, skating wasn't at its peak or maybe it was like right before the peak, which meant it was mainstream enough for Disney to be like, we're going to have a bunch of clean cut, mostly white guys show up in this movie. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so one of my favorite lines ever delivered in a movie comes from this movie. They're at the, it's not the invitational, it's some like regional championship, of course. And Brink is back on the Soul Skaters team and he's not with the X-Blades anymore. And he he does their like the vert challenge, which is just like street skating. And he like falls, which is like a huge, oh no, he fell and he didn't get the points he needed. But then there's a brief interlude where he goes, talks to his mom and his little sister who are in the stands. And his little sister is, of course, the corny, like 90s TV show, like little sister who's always bragging on his little, her older brother. And she just says, skate better. She's like, I have some advice for you. She's like, skate better. And he's like, mom, (laughs) skate better. And then he just skates away and is perfect and of course he does skate better and they win wow. the entire thing of course they do beautiful fantastic if you love la and southern california and like skater and like x games culture like this is the movie for you although you probably don't need to hear that because you probably watch this which is why you love that stuff in the first place it sounds like disney's rocket power maybe or it must have been well, around honestly the same time. they share some dna no rocket power came probably five or six years later, but they definitely share some of the same DNA of just like, oh, this is Southern California, surfing adjacent, skating adjacent, like street culture of kids who clearly don't need to work. And so they put all their time into rolling (laughs) around town on wheels or surfboards. Oh, to grow up in a nice suburban Orange County house. Truly. All right. Wait a minute. Brink. Brink. Yeah, Brink. All right. So there's Brink. I also was in the Disney camp recently. Because uh, we wanted to watch something inspirational, and I remembered a movie, and I was like, I think it's inspirational enough, and I just feel like watching something with Shia LaBeouf, and that does run. Yes. <laughs> How about The Greatest Game Ever Played? Have you I, seen I this have, movie? I have seen this one. This is very good. 2005, Shia Surprise. It's free Transformers post holes and it has one of his holes cast members who plays zigzag in there this is a great movie i didn't realize until this rewatch the first 45 minutes are just about this poor boy wanting to be rich and it's not as inspirational as i thought it was That's just the oldest story ever told it is and it's a not just uniquely american it's just a it's in our dna to want these yeah. stories so 2005 i'm like okay We've invaded Rack, all kinds of things going on. It's still hyper patriotic. This had to be the story that came out. So it's about the 1913 U.S. Open when a 20 year old kid named Francis Wimet, whose father was French Canadian, his mother was Irish. He was just kind of a misfit, poor family living on a golf course, living by a golf course, rather. He had been a caddy most of his life, entered some tournaments, whiffed it, came back to play against the champ. Englishman Harry Vardone, or rather play on the same U.S. Open as him, and how he goes on to prove that from humble circumstances you can be great. All these other things. I I, I don't have to worry about spoilers. It's a 15-year-old, almost 20-year-old movie. It's directed by Bill Paxton, which I did not know. So, yeah. our Bill Paxton, rest in peace. Apollo 13, Twister, Nightcrawler, Edge of Tomorrow. He directed it. And the writer was Mark Frost, who wrote the 2005 Fantastic Four, 
do with that what you may. Who also wrote Twin Peaks, which I did not know. So he just was, you know what? Twin Peaks, Storyville, All Souls, Fantastic Four. I'm just going to write a Disney movie about golf. And it's fantastic. And he took a break afterwards to go ahead and just sit back for 10 years. And then he wrote Twin Peaks, The Return on Showtime. So anyway, good writing, fun, great acting from the kids. And it reminds me of when Disney was making live action movies like this. Remember the Titans? They had a whole string of movies, it felt like, in the early 2000s, like like Brink, late 90s, of just like live action, fun, good for the whole family movies that you could just watch and watch again that I don't know that I've seen as much recently. I think it's either animation or Marvel, like yeah. they have their own sectors now. Anyway, it's a fun one. Shia LaBeouf is great. And in the last half of the movie, it also reminded me it wasn't fully his story. Harry, played by Stefan Delane, takes up a good chunk of it, and it's parallel stories of these two kids coming from nothing who have rised above their means. And I just love a good, based in, based on a true story. So, of course, by the time the title cards flash in the back with stats, I just want to cry. Anyway, it's a fun one. It's two hours. Go watch it on Disney+. Plus and, uh, yeah. What's up with Shia LaBeouf playing characters with weird last names? Because in Transformers, his last name is Witwicky, and in this one, it's We Met. And also, his dad's a piece of shit in this one. And there's some redemption at the end, but mm-hmm. after watching Honey Boy, I was like, ooh, did he just find these things? Did they find him? Yeah. I mean, he played John McEnroe, which is not too funny of a name, but still, yeah. it's not great. Sam Witwicky, <laughs> yeah, more. We Jerry met. Sean, Eagle Eye. What was his name in Even Stevens? Oh, last name was Stevens. Duh. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, you're on to it. I was going to say, I saw... So he was part of a small play at this little tiny Venice theater months and months ago I went and saw. Yeah. And it was cool because I was one of like 30 audience members. So third row, very tiny. And as he's giving his speech, he stares directly at me. And I'm going to say, even knowing he's problematic in the rest of it, He's just the childhood actor that got huge from our generation. Yes, yeah. And because of that, I'm like, it must be how like people who grew up watching Charlie Sheen movies felt. Like once he made it big right. and really made it, and then he still had his fall, there's still somewhere in your heart that's like, ah, but this is our guy. It's just our that, guy. No, absolutely. I've been watching through, obviously, the Transformers movies because we're about to do a series on Militainment. Yeah. But just watching Shia LaBeouf, I'm just like, I like you. You're problematic in real life, and I see why you're problematic is because you had a shitty like upbringing, and it's just wounds perpetuating themselves out in the future. But damn, if he isn't funny, <laughs> I know. Damn, if I don't like him on screen. Yeah, he's just he's got great timing. He really just knows how to do it right. And that play I saw was Henry Johnson. It's a David Mamet play who wrote Chicago among all kinds of other things. Anyway, Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. So yeah. Did you did you watch Even Stevens growing up? I watched a bit of it. It was always when I went to a friend's house and stuff without yeah. Disney. But yeah, it was like Disney's Malcolm in the Middle. It, it was, was. It was it solid. Was, it was genuinely a funny show. And I remember like when it first came out thinking like, whoa, this kid is – this guy's funny. Because <clears throat> I think he was in a couple of Disney Channel original movies. But when he was on Even Stevens, I was like, I like this guy's energy. Like he's actually legitimately funny. And I feel like I've seen some TikToks with his co-star. I don't know what her name is, but his sister in the show – where she's just talking about how like they were trying to put the plot together, but then Shia LaBeouf just comes in and he's just really funny and really talented. And then it just like clicked and everything moved from there when they were trying to put even Stevens together. Yeah. His uh, co-star was Christy Carlson Romano. Yes. Chris. Oh my gosh. How could I forget? She's one of my earliest loves, Christy Carlson Romano. <laughs> and she also voiced Kim possible. Oh my gosh. Who has also done quite a bit of work. Yeah. I was going to say, just looked her up real quick. She produced on, Full House Rewind, uh, Ned's Declassified Podcast Survival Guide. Okay, podcast series, Wizards of Waverly Pod. But she's done a ton of acting. I'm seeing 81 credits right now. All right. If you were to take my taste in women and then trace it directly back to the Disney Channel, it'd be like a one-for-one matchup. It was a young awakening. (laughs) Yeah, okay, I remember her. Yep, that's too funny. Even Stevens, Shia LaBeouf. Nostalgia or not, we love it. What else have you been watching? 
I've been watching Bob's Burgers a little bit. It's when I have a day where I'm just like either hungover or I'm just in bed all day and I'm tired, I'll just throw on Bob's Burgers because it is one of the most like consistent shows I've ever seen. Yeah. On Sunday night, I there was a meteor, the peak night for the Perseid meteor shower was Sunday. And I did not get home and fall asleep until about 5 a.m., which was very late, <laughs> almost early. And so I spent all day, because mind you, dear listeners, I am unemployed. And so I spent all day in bed, just like fighting off taking a nap because I didn't want to take a nap because I hate taking naps. And I was just like, I'm just going to watch Bob's Burgers because it is just consistently quality. Yeah. And so I've been watching a little Bob's Burgers occasionally. It recently came up in the media because of Jay Johnston, who played Jimmy Pesto, being arrested for his role in January 6th. <laughs> Never. That is the most Jimmy Pesto thing he could have done. Yeah. Really poor showing. Anyway, Bob's Burgers is one of those shows that I've watched some... But I've never sat down and watched all of it. I know my sister absolutely loves it. And it has a huge cult following. Yeah. And where are you watching it? Is it streaming on Hulu? It's on Hulu, yeah. I don't know how you could possibly you could possibly catch up on it by just like being dedicated to watching it all the time. But like there's a lot of it's almost it's obviously less than The Simpsons, but there's a lot of seasons of it. Like it's been going for like 10 years or so. And and so like I'm actually I'm not even caught up on it. I remember I watched I think the first five seasons and then lost steam watching other things. And now it's just a thing where I don't remember almost anything about the show, so I can just go back and choose any episode and just watch it. And I'm just like, oh cool, I'm seeing this for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I just looked. Uh, season 15 premieres September 29th, 2024. Damn. So the end of next month, season 15 premieres. That is a lot of Bob's Burgers. Let me ask you this. Where does it stack up in your mind against Simpsons Futurama? I don't know if you watch Family Guy. Any uh, of those more adult yeah. shows. This one is certainly, I would say, it's more family-oriented. Like, I think Family Guy is not family-oriented. Like, that's not a... That, family Guy is not a show that I would want to watch with my parents, I don't think. Granted, I've watched a lot of stuff with my parents that I think other people would, would be like, what are you doing, guy? I'm like, Game of Thrones, <laughs> Westworld, all the kind of stuff. But uh, this is certainly more family-oriented than those. Like, it, it definitely is in the same neighborhood as The Simpsons, because I remember growing up not being able to watch, not being let or allowed to watch The Simpsons. Yeah. And then watching it now with an, as an adult, I'm like, what was the problem? Like, this show is so it's tame. tame. It's so tame. So it's probably, I would say, it shares a lot of DNA with The Simpsons. In terms of yeah. quality, because I have, I'm not caught up, I don't know if the quality actually does dip or peak or anything. Because I know that The Simpsons certainly peaked in the 90s, in the early 2000s. Like, that was its peak era. Conan O'Brien was writing yeah. at the time. And I know that its quality has fallen off. And obviously, I'm not caught up on it, and so I'm, I have no idea how it is now. But Bob's Burgers, to me, it feels like every time I watch it, like it's super formulaic and in a really good way where you watch enough episodes in a row, you, you just know how the episode is going to flow. And I think the inclusion of having like random musical song numbers is really good. I think the, the characters are fantastic. The three kids are really great. Bob is really funny. Linda is really funny. And it's just as like, you know, what I love about Bob's Burgers, and this is funny, I love the credits because each wow. credits is a bespoke song for the episode. And when I, when we, when the world ends and everyone's dead, I hope that we get an end credit scene that is just like, on the one hand, cinematic, beautiful, the at the at the end of the Return of the King, where you just get like this fantastic credit scene with this fantastic song. But on the other hand, I hope our credit scene is as silly and dancey as a Bob's Burgers credit scene. My, that's my <laughs> wish. That's a good wish. That's a good wish. All right, Bob's Burgers on Hulu. What about you? The last thing I want to talk about today, I'm going to keep it real short, is Trap by M. Night Shyamalan. And I know now, by the time this comes out, it will have been weeks to a month, but we know how things are going. It's going to suddenly be on streaming. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Here's what I'll say about this movie. Is it bad? Yes, at points. <laughs> M. Night Shyamalan and Dialogue are like oil and water. They just can't mix. But that's why they work. It's almost like watching a 1950s teleplay or an old episode of The Twilight Zone. There's something yeah. so false about it, it just feels like operatic. 
It's a fun movie. It's weird. It's probably on my list of like a two and a half to three star, but it's a fun two and a half to three star. I think everyone should watch. That's you're not the first person to say that like quality is bad, but it's still fun. Yeah. My swan song I'll never shut up about is I want people to take big swings and do something crazy. He does that. We all saw the trailer. Not we all. Many people saw the trailer and understood what the conceit was. A lot of people I've talked to did not already know the conceit, so I won't spoil that. But Josh Hartnett does an amazing job. And that Shyamalan's daughter, who is a real musician, takes center stage through much of the movie. Her music is good. It's fun. And if we're just spitballing and pitching ideas and saying, hey, what could we do for this amount of money for a movie? How do we make a twist to make it fun? He did deliver on that. He was like, what if you're at a Taylor Swift concert and you're trapped and there's a big police raid trying to find this guy? What happens next? And he delivers on that and it's fun. And a Shyamalan twist could have been cheese here. It was good, but it wasn't that cheesy. So <laughs> it's fun. Maybe when it's on streaming, I'll give it a watch. And that is what I hope most people will say. If this hits Netflix or HBO in the next month, I hope everyone just goes, just go give it a watch. You'll be like, okay, the 1% reviews of absolutely loving it because it's perfect are insane. The 40% reviews who are like, it's trash, stop watching his movies, also a little harsh. I think it belongs where it belongs. It's fun. I went through most of my bag of popcorn. Lots of chuckles in the theater the whole time. It was a fun movie. Oh, good. It's good to know. Josh Hartnett lives again. And we're not mad about it. He's great. No, he's a good he's a good dude. I remember Pearl Har- watching Pearl Harbor and being like, wow, that guy looks so cool. I want to be him. Yeah, we I was talking about this with some friends of like, if you're of a certain age, you know who Josh Hartnett is. And my friend yeah. specifically said for girls, if you're of a certain age, girls and or gay guys. He was it. He was like the hotness. But it's such a very specific window. If you didn't see all the press and watch Pearl Harbor, and if you didn't watch Black Hawk Down, you didn't really know who he was, right? Yeah, yeah. It was He's like time. this dream. I have three sisters, right? And so yeah. my sisters were definitely in that window where he's this new Hollywood heartthrob, and he had the 90s heartthrob hair. And he, while being a really good-looking guy, he's got – these really kind looking eyes. Yeah. And there's just, that's just how his face is put together. <clears throat> and then I thought the world forgot about him until Oppenheimer. And then when he showed up in Oppenheimer, I was like, what the hell? Is that Josh Hartnett as a man? As a yeah, grown up wait, man? <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part is, looking at his IMDb, he was working little things, videos here or there, little bits over the last 10, 12 years. So he was doing a couple things, but it wasn't much. And yeah, honestly, Oppenheimer has put him back on the map in a huge way. I think he's shown in every scene. Everyone talks about Downey Jr. and whoever else. I think he was up there with him and just having a very good presence. I don't think his character had to be too crazy. But also, his little pop-up in the bear was fun. I thought that was great. He was just in an episode of Black Mirror last year, which I heard is really good. And he just is this kind, good soul that I hope someone will take to the next level or be like, I'm going to cast him in something bold. People will watch him do this. Because that's what I think he has the ability to. to I get him into a Star Wars or a Marvel. That's how how it happens. Or at least then he makes his money to do something indie crazy and just be wild. Yeah. I was going to say on him being a nice guy, during the press tour for Trap... He tells a story of he was at a concert and his friend took him backstage or he's sitting side stage watching some performances, whatever else. And this guy walks up to him and he's like, oh, my gosh, you're Josh Hartnett, Pearl Harbor, man, Black Hawk Down. And Josh was like, yeah, man, what's up? Shakes his hand. He's like, I really enjoy the music. And this guy's like, I'm up and coming. Can you direct a music video for me? And Josh was like, sure, dude. Well, just tell me your vision. Let's figure out what we're going to go do. And that was a guy named Kid Cudi. So he directed the Pursuit of Happiness music video, which is fun. Good guy, Josh Hartnett. We're a fan. Good guy, Josh Hartnett. We love a, we love a nice guy. For everybody else, watch nice movies. Watch some nice TV. We have lots more to talk about. Like Madison alluded to, we've got a Militainment series coming very soon. Go watch Pearl Harbor. 
<laughs> or Black Hawk Down. Anyway, thanks again for listening. Make sure to like, subscribe, share with friends and family, and check out some of our older episodes if this is your first time listening. Thank you.